Hi, uh, welcome to the earliest possible session um, of this conference, day one, session one. Um, we're looking to talk about Global South solidarities for global digital governance, but um, because the Global South has not woken up <laughs> so far, uh, we are, hi. Um, so, you know, there are a couple of things to just say out loud. Our, our co-organizers, um, Rafa from Data Privacy Brazil couldn't make it, but we have Nathan, which is wonderful, and Jacqueline on online. Um, uh, we also have Benga, who we are waiting for. We know he's in Kyoto, um, and he's from the Paradigm Initiative. And I am Asta Kapoor. I'm the co-founder of Apti Institute. We're a tech policy research firm based in Bangalore. Uh, what we are looking to discuss today um, is this idea of Global South Solidarities. Uh, I know that some of this was discussed earlier at RightsCon as well. Um, and we're looking to build on some of that work and also discuss issues that are common between uh, different parts of the Global South and then to ask the next set of questions of what needs to be done. Uh, again, I know that this has happened once before, so I have updates on that discussion. Two main ones. The first is that Data Privacy Brazil has advertised for the role of a digital librarian. Uh, this digital librarian is going to work with uh, organizations like all of ours to help curate uh, knowledge online. And they will be the single point of person uh, of, of contact to help understand what are some of the issues. So if you, for instance, have a question around, hey, what is happening with uh, data governance in India, then you could potentially pose this question to the digital librarian who will send you then a set of readings. Um, and so the idea is to make sure that we're not all um, recreating the wheel, we're not all um, you know, asking the same questions in different kinds of voids, and make sure that you know, we can all have a space where all the different knowledge that we produce can be curated, uh, organized and also disseminated. So there's been a call for applications and um, Data Privacy Brazil, Apti Institute and Pri Paradigm Initiatives are trying to bring that together. Uh, the second announcement is that um, since the Costa Rica event, um, the again, Data Privacy Brazil has been in the process of organizing a fund um, for research initiatives in the Global South. And that's what I wanted to start off this discussion with, is because uh, we've been going back and forth with Rafa and Bruno to understand where the value of this fund is, what it can do and what it can't do. Um, and uh, would love to get some thoughts from this group to understand that when we think of research and the Global South, and if you had a small amount of money, I think it's $8,000 uh, to do a piece of research, what do you think would be a valuable way to apportion that money? And uh, we'll use this question as a way to also uncover what the major issues are that we want to focus on and where we see the conversation moving. Um, Nathan, did I miss anything? Hi, everyone. Uh, I think you can hear me. Uh, so this is a, a great opportunity for us to, to discuss how to, to engage in a, in a global southern perspective. Uh, so as Ashta, Asta, sorry, <laughs> she, she uh, just said, uh, we have this initiative on the digital librarian uh, that will play a key role uh, for the this organization of digital information uh, regarding digital rights. Uh, and soon, maybe, uh, we'll have this, this chosen person that will be this digital librarian. Uh, and I think it would be interesting to, to hear from uh, other people that are, are here. Uh, so we can think on how start to, to engage uh, or how to, to strengthen our engagement uh, between global southern countries and global southern organizations 
uh, maybe I pass the, pass the mic to you. I, I don't know your name, what's your name? Osama, okay. Uh, thank you very much, I'm Osama Khilji, I'm director of Bolo Bhi in Pakistan. Um, so I wanted to start off with a bit of like what the major issues with you know, internet governance in the global south are. Um, and I think it really stems from um, securitization of the internet itself. Um, and I think we really need to pick on a set of principles that can sort of uh, lay the groundwork for, okay, what is the purpose of the internet? And what do we envision? So now, what are the threats to an open internet that we see in the global south right now? So there's a lot of investment in surveillance technologies that um, really undermine the the basics of the internet. So for example, you have um, throttling, internet throttling, you have internet shutdowns, um, and then there's also the issue of um, uh, trying to uh, bring in regulations that sort of take over what the companies are doing and imposing those sets of regulation on social media and internet companies um, that then overall undermines your freedom of expression and privacy rights on the internet. So looking at that sort of, uh, you know, the, the landscape that we see as we have it today, um, how, as the global south, how do we envision the internet? So are we going to allow uh, big players that have their political issues to overshadow how we look at the internet. So for example, the Chinese firewall or with the Russia-Ukraine invasion, we've seen um, how so much of the internet is now censored. So you can't get information from other countries just because of a political conflict that's going on. Um, and because of that, uh, the w we're seeing the borders of the world being reflected onto the internet and the whole point of the internet was to connect the world in a way where there are no borders. Uh, so for me, I think it's really the question of how do we get rid of these borders that we ha are starting to build over the internet and that are really uh, strengthening. So your experience of using the internet in one country is very dissimilar to the use of internet in another. Um, and I think that's fundamentally the problem with how a lot of the uh, states are moving towards digital authoritarianism um, and changing the experience that we have. Um, so I think, you know, keeping these in mind, it'd be useful to go forward and think of how do we strategize and how do we build solidarities where people like us who believe in an open internet can sort of push for the internet to remain so. Uh, would you like to say something? Okay. Um, are you guys participating? Come. Okay. Um, so it, it's super interesting because, and I mean, I don't know why we're doing this on a mic now, but um, it's uh, what we've been seeing in India as well, and I would love to hear what's going on in Brazil. Uh, is that uh, we we see that the internet, as as you rightly said, is both being used as a way to exclude people, so internet shutdowns, um, but also because you know there are people who are not connected, etc. So on, on all kinds of ways, um, <coughs> access is being limited. Um, so you know we have uh, a state of unrest in an eastern part of India. The internet has been shut down for many many days um, since, and and so that changes the way people access information. That changes the way people understand the situation. That changes the way. Um, the government or certain groups can control the narrative um, because that organic, potentially dangerous nature of the internet is curbed. Um, what also happens is that, and again, you said this, is that the internet is also, or digital technologies are also used to um, create mechanisms of surveillance. Um, so it's it's a double-edged sword because in some instances, I was reading somewhere that um, you know Syrian refugees that are coming into the borders of Europe, their phones are actively snatched mm. and broken down because nobody wants to hear the stories that they've been chronicling. So how do we sort of grapple the head around these divergent ideas of the internet and what it can and cannot do? And then the second question, I guess, oh, a small disagreement with you is that you said people's experiences with the internet 
are dissimilar, which they are in in where you are in your journey in some ways, but they're also similar in the way that harms are perpetuated. So Uber drivers across the world are suffering similar kinds of harms. It doesn't matter whether you're in Paris or in, in, in London. So while I, or, or in India, right? Like the, the protests and the nature of the protests that the Uber drivers have been doing against platforms globally have similar language. Yeah. Um, their ability to claim rights is very different in Europe because of GDPR and very different yeah. in other parts of the world. So there is, I think, a lot of like significant nuance that is required because the idea of solidarity, solidarity with whom, mm -hmm. solidarity basis what experience, I think is really important to think about. I don't think that we could have solidarities with some countries in the global south that don't experience internet shutdowns. That is very peculiar yeah. to us. So I, I think that the global south experience is extremely valuable, but then to nuance that solidarity is also going to be quite interesting and maybe the research work can help do that. Uh, I think that uh, just to, to start with um, some issues that you brought uh, related to internet shutdowns uh, or stuff like that. Uh, in Brazil, actually, we, we don't have uh, internet shutdowns, uh, gratefully. <laughs> but uh, we do have sometimes uh, some apps uh, are blocked uh, for a criminal investigation or something like that. You know, uh, It already happened to Telegram and WhatsApp. Uh, in, in order to, uh, because of some judicial orders to to block the app so they can uh, comply to investigations and, and open uh, cryptography uh, to, to have access to, to messages. So we do have that. Uh, and we are in a context in Brazil that we are seeking the platform regulation uh, since January, uh, basically. Uh, and we... The, it, it's a, a comprehensive uh, a bill that will try to to, to regulate a platform, uh, and it's been a, a very uh, hard process in Brazil because there are a several conflicts of interests uh, between civil society and private sector, for example, that doesn't want the, the same thing, uh, and they have to to arrive in a consensus, <laughs> which is hard. Uh, and there was, uh, I think, a, 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 an episode in, in Brazil where big techs, uh, they, they invested uh, money and people and staff to do uh, lobby with the, or advocacy strategies within the, the, the legislatives, the, the parliament, parliamentaries, to, to try to push the, 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 the platform regulation bill for, for their side. Uh, and I think that it's worth mentioning that uh, now the President Lula, President Lula in, Bra in Brazil uh, is seeking to, to look towards the, the decent work uh, theme. So it's uh, an agenda for Brazil right now, especially within the G20. Uh, uh, and platform regulation has a close relationship with, with this uh, with this agenda for workers. So we are looking into that uh, also in Data Privacy Brazil and try to work with this, uh, also with this agenda uh, in the, the G20 uh, groups, focus groups that they have. Um, and I, I think that uh, one last thing that we should uh, maybe start to discuss is to understand uh, what are the, the the spaces, institutional spaces, where we can uh, discuss and address these kind of issues. Because we have some different organizations, such as the ITU or, uh, or even the IGF or other organizations or other multi multilateral organizations that discuss such themes. And I think it's worth to, to understand uh, how can we build uh, collective knowledge collective knowledge to uh, to work uh, or to act within these spaces, you know, to understand how can we engage with these spaces. I think it's a, a very interesting question for us to to start again our discussion here. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks so much for that. Uh, some new people have walked in, which is great. Um, would you like to talk about, we're talking about 
what are Global South solidarities and what are the institutional spaces to enact some of these Global South solidarities. Um, there's a mic over there next to you. It would be great if you can introduce yourself. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Tobegile Matimbe, and I work for Paradigm Initiative. And um, I think some of the platforms that we see um, an opportunity for, um, you know, work and, and collaboration um, are platforms such as, um, of course, the, um, you know, the African Internet Governance Forum, but on a global scale, of course, being here as well, the IGF. But also there are a number of convenings that are happening at least within um, the African continent. Um, such platforms include one that we particularly uh, convene, which is called the Digital Rights and Inclusion Forum. We've um, made use of that platform, I think, in the past year. We did a good collaborative effort with um, Data Privacy Brazil, um, and we are hoping to um, continue to, to engage, to share experiences, and draw from each other's context. As we see, I think there are a, a number of commonalities there for us. Um, we've, I think two weeks ago, there was another forum for internet freedom in Africa as well, which was uh, a good platform as well to be able to engage. Um, and there's always room, I think, um, for us to be able to, you know, streamline what are the spaces that we can really make the most impact in terms of changing policy. Um, and in terms of as well pushing for um, for data governance. And for us, what we've seen um, as useful as well is um, being able to, um, you know, put out even joint statements or uh, joint submissions. Um, we've collaborated uh, with with organizations as well, such as um, Kicktonet, Data Privacy Brazil, um, APT, to be able to, um, you know, put up, put forward our response with regards to the GDC process. So I think th that's something that I just highlight, um, you know, as as an open sort of like remark. Yeah. Um, no, that's that's super interesting, and I think that um, I think that it would be important to identify certain opportunities for us to, um, you know, like you brought up, the GDC is certainly a big one. I think in which we all have something to say, and the process has been quite consultative. You also mentioned G20, and you know, we're rolling off an India presidency into a Brazilian one, and then it goes to South Africa. So there's the a very strong uh, troika uh, for G20, which can be um, definitely leveraged to embed some of these conversations. I know we've been talking about digital public infrastructure and you know PICS and and UPI, which is the Indian version of um, you know a, a payment protocol, come up all the time. I think it's just the start of day one, but a uh, several day zero uh, panels. We're also talking about technologies that are being developed in the Global South and how they can be brought into the world and offer an alternative to, you know, the ideas of big tech uh, that exist globally. So um, there's, there's tons to chew on. What I would really love to move um, direction into is that I would love to understand if there are um, best practices of harnessing solidarities that you've identified in your work, uh, if you think organizations and movements globally have come together to uh, create institutional financial uh, architectures, I guess, uh, and how do we learn from those? Osama, I'm gonna go to you. Um, yeah, thank you. I think, you know, as we know, there are some regions that are super, um, you know, there's a lot more solidarity. So for example, when we look at the African region and in Latin America, we see a lot of, um, uh, you know, events and co coordination happening. But I think unfortunately in Asia, especially South Asia, uh, a lot of the, the political issues between the governments um, don't allow uh, civil society groups to convene locally, other than say in Nepal or Sri Lanka, we've had a few convenings. Uh, but other than that, but, but when you look at the issues, it's like 
if you're talking about India, just I could just replace India with Pakistan and literally be the same issues, right? And even when you look at the legislation, so in Bangladesh, in India, and in Pakistan, uh, they mirror each other. So there's a lot of potential for collaboration there. Um, so with the Global Network Initiative, we've seen because the membership base has been growing, there's been a lot of space and focus on um, on uh, uh, you know, especially Global South, across Global South, so there's an Africa uh, focal uh, sort of group loosely, then there's Latin America and there's Asia, and a lot of times we sit together to discuss these things, so that's super key and important. And then of course at RightsCon and at IGF, there's often convenings such as the one we're having, but we also need to look at the issues with it, right? So for example, take today for example, it's IGF, one of our panelists was not allowed in the country because of immigration issues. Um, then we look at the timing, it's 8.30 a.m. here, which means in most of the countries that we come from, it's either uh, you know 4 a.m., so yeah. crack of dawn. So how do you organize a session for a region without keeping into account the time zone that they're in. So I think such like barriers also need to be looked at and critiqued um, in order for us to really uh, go forward in a way that's productive. Um, but I think like, and then we also need to look at issues of access. So how many people or voices from the Global South are able to become a part of conversations such as these? Um, you know, there, it takes a lot of privilege to be able to travel to conferences and to uh, make submissions, get the visas in time, uh, get your bookings, etc. cetera. Um, and then online participation, there's you know restrictions on that as well. So I think the approach has to be holistic so that it's representative. Um, but at the same time, I think it's important that we also start to uh, not let states lead these discussions. It needs to be a multi-stakeholder approach. So for looking at what states are doing, a lot of it is oppressive towards the majority of the populations. Um, and I think civil society needs to adopt a similar language to be able to uh, deal with states and to be able to negotiate so that power can come from solidarity. Um, and I think that's what we really need to crack. Perfect. Thank you for saying that, uh, both about the structural as well as the some of the functional issues. I know some people have joined. It would be lovely if you guys, this is a networking session, so you don't really have to listen to us. You can have a voice and a seat at the table. So if you guys could just come up front, that'd be amazing. We'll hand you a mic uh, to introduce yourselves. Not to put everyone on the spot, but it would be great if you guys came up front. I know they slotted us early, so maybe they'll give us a little bit of time to get warmed up and stay in the room. Um, so we're just trying to understand both commonalities, differences, and how we can mobilize for action in the context of the Global South. Uh, we, we have with us uh, Data Privacy Brazil. Um, I'm from APTI Institute. Bolo B. Bolo B from Pakistan, uh, Paradigms Initiative. Uh, from Nigeria. Zimbabwe. <laughs> uh, so uh, we're, we're trying to understand where, uh, and what Data Privacy Brazil has done to start us off on this journey is that they have a digital librarian who's going to hold all this knowledge from the Global South and make sure that we can hear about it, reach out to this person and say, hey, what's going on in this part of the world? And then they can send us readings, materials, thinking. Uh, they're also launching um, a, a a fund uh, to do research on some of these questions. And that's what we're also trying to understand that where both what kind of problems do we want to uncover and then also how do we want to come together and the the harsh realities of the fact that we can't travel very easily. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so just wanted to pass the mic around. Please introduce yourself, vent your anxieties. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Ifran. I'm from Bangladesh. Uh, I'm a, a senior lecturer in law and uh, human rights researcher, you can say. So uh, I think I've just uh, just entered into the room and, and trying to understand what you're actually trying to say. But the 
uh, access to knowledge is actually one of the problems that we have been facing in my country, particularly as a uh, law professor in Bangladesh. I can see my students are uh, having acute shortage of uh, uh, original textbook, and, and the online resources are actually, for, for example, the journal articles or the research papers are not accessible for them. They are actually mostly burnt to the paywalls. And they're, they're not easy way to uh, I mean, access them. You need to uh, go to the pirated sites. And, 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 and sites like the Sci-Hub, which I frequently use, and I found it quite useful. And thanks to that, that lady who has actually uh, brought it uh, in for us. But, but what about uh, uh, sharing the knowledge? I mean, how the, the, the knowledge divide between the North and South can be alleviated? I mean, uh, I don't have any specific answer. I'm here to learn from uh, everyone from you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Fernanda from Brazil. Um, I am one of the directors at Internet Lab, a think tank based in Sao Paulo. And we are close to Data Privacy Brazil. So I will be in the next conference in November. And I am here to meet you better and exchange more about Global South and the challenges that we are facing in the, in the, at this moment. So nice to see, nice, nice to see you all. My name is Miki. Uh, I'm from Japan. I'm working sometimes with NGOs, but uh, in, uh, most of the time I'm working for a startup. And there are startups which are providing uh, primary information from all over the all over the world. So we have uh, more than uh, uh, one thousand uh, sources. We are collecting actually the information, the primary uh, uh, information uh, about uh, lots of uh, social issues. And the, uh, then uh, it's because uh, we need to we, we think that uh, everyone in the world <laughs> uh, all all people need to uh, must have the the, uh, the the information to think uh, by themselves to have the, the real democracy, and uh, we are trying to uh, to uh, to create a platform uh, of people. And uh, sorry, I would like to uh, uh, ask the question uh, about the Brazil. You, you, you talked about it, you, uh, sorry, I, I forgot the name. Nathan. 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 Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, you, you said that it was difficult to have the consensus, uh, to have the platform, uh, to create the platform between uh, civil society and private sectors. And you, I think you, uh, uh, you needed to, to manage. So I would like to know what was really the, the difficulties that you, you thought, you, you felt, and how you managed to, uh, to build. Uh, actually, I, I didn't work with uh, specifically with the, the legislative process with the, uh, related to to the platform regulation, but we what we could see uh, in the Brazilian case was that there are a, a very s a high conflict of interest between big techs or other platforms from Brazil. Uh, ex for example, we have a, a very big uh, delivery platform in Brazil called iFood, uh, that has a, a close relationship with, uh, with the, 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 the workers' movement, what they, what the, they demand from the, the platforms. Uh, so we have this situation in which there is very distinct uh, interests uh, that they might have to be handled mm -hmm. so we can build a, a, a a comprehensive and uh, uh, and uh, a good regulation for platforms, but this is, was the scenario in general, uh, a very uh, strict and uh, high conflict of interest between s uh, several uh, societal sectors, from for example from civil society or private sector, and there were interests from uh, government agents too. So there is this uh, chaotic scenario uh, to trying to build uh, the regulation. Uh, 
I would like to just uh, add one thing that you said uh, related to, to barriers uh, to trying to engage in organizations or, or something like that. Uh, we'll be launching on Friday morning a report uh, regarding, it, it's called Voices from Global South uh, and where we interviewed some activists from Global South to understand uh, what are the, the, the institutional spaces uh, that they are willing to engage or that they comprehend as uh, um, a fruitful space for engagement for a Global South organization. And uh, IGF was one of these this spaces. Uh, but they also highlighted uh, some issues related to financial support to attend these conferences because most of them are held uh, in the north, global north. So there is this, this traveling issue uh, or visa issues that it, it might happen. So in this report, we, we, would, we were able to gather all this information through interviews to under understand uh, which are these spaces uh, and what are the, the pros and cons of each one and to understand how to to try to build this collective knowledge on how to engage in this uh, in these spaces. So on Friday morning on the Human Rights and Standards uh, panel, we'll be launching the, the, the report and will be available in English. So I think it will be more <laughs> uh, accessible for, for most of the people. Thank you. Rubikina, you want to come in? I'll just highlight that from our own experience engaging with the private sector, it's something that we've been, you know, consciously and deliberately trying to to achieve in terms of a good working um, sort of like model of engaging with the private sector. Because what we've discovered is that when we're trying to engage a lot with the private sector, they are usually reluctant, maybe is a good word to use here, to be actually on the table, be in the room for us to have a, you know, a conversation around the, the issues that need to be addressed, especially when we're looking at policy and how policy needs to be developed in a, in a way that best suits um, fundamental rights and freedoms. And um, what we've, we've f found to be more useful is to, you know, sort of like, um, have closed door meetings um, with the few actors, but also we've stepped up to invite um, the private sector to also be involved in some of the regional convenings that, that we host. And we've, we can safely say we've got a few, probably a couple of, you know, of big companies that are, you know, supportive in terms of showing up um, and being part of these conversations. But I think definitely we, we share, I think, the same sentiments um, that have been already raised here, that it's, you know, it's a bit tricky sometimes. I'd maybe perhaps being um, an issue of business expediency and trying to operate for companies in a certain jurisdiction and trying to make sure that um, probably they're aligned with, with the government. Um, but we continue to push back and call for even transparency uh, with regards to how uh, the private sector engages with the government, and we found that being um, very useful. Um, but also just, you know, touching on the, the earlier conversation around, you know, the discrimination, what I call the discriminatory practices that, you know, push away certain groups of people, particularly from the global south, to participate in certain platforms that ideally would be useful and meaningful with regards to shaping the discourse back in the global south, um, looking at the visa processes. I think this is something that we experienced at RightsCon, and um, we are here um, at, at, the, at the global IGF, and um, yeah, I think it's already been mentioned, one of our colleagues from um, Data Privacy Brazil could not be here because of you know, some of these things that, are, that we're discussing. So how do we go forward and ensure that whatever processes that we're discussing as being useful and meaningful, are pro I mean, are platforms that are actually accessible to to everyone so that we are able to bring our voices together. Um, that being said, looking at the financial aspect of things, that's another form of exclusion because what we're saying is we want to be able to form a you know, critical mass or a critical movement that um, you know, pushes back against the violations that we're seeing in our different countries within the global south. And how can we become more and more um, efficient together because I think 
definitely what we've been doing so far together, I think it's showing that I think there is definitely force and there's definitely strength in, you know, um, in achieving what we want to achieve as a Global South because we understand our experiences better. Um, we've got lessons that we can share with each other and definitely we can leverage on um, our expertise so that we are able to do great things together. Um, why do I say that? I think definitely there's something that you've already mentioned um, about, you know, the, the research element of things where we're saying we can pull together, you know, the great work that we've done and through that research are able to actually map if there are any, if there are, you know, um, any uh, golden threads that we can we can we can pick out from there and draw learnings and be able to make critical recommendations, learn from uh, Latin America and what's happening there, bring it into the context perhaps of, of certain African uh, jurisdictions and be able to apply that and shape what we want to shape. And it's apart from research and and that l knowledge base that we're trying to, you know, put together, we are also being able to sort of like see how we can continue to elevate even growing organizations on. The, on, uh, not just on the continent, but within the global south, um, to be able to uh, grow in the digital rights space and um, having that sort of like a solid fund that we're able to, you know, um, be able to assist those who are coming up. I think it's something that is going towards, um, you know, what we want to see, the environment that we want to see, and internet governance that we want to see uh, within the global south so that we're able to sort of make steps towards overcoming some of our barriers and the things that we're facing every day. Sure, yeah, I just um, wanted to end the um, note with, um, well, first you spoke about uh, you know engagement with the private sector and from our experiences in Pakistan what we've seen whenever there's a convergence between the civil society and company front like we work together quite well so for example when the state's trying to bring in new legislative proposals that obviously do not su suit either civil society or companies so there's a lot of um, solidarity with the companies as weird as it sounds um, and I think that's a good model to also look at because sometimes when private sector and civil society joins forces then the state has to backtrack a bit um, so that, that that's something I, I wanted to touch upon uh, but overall what it sounds like is that we have good research we have good um, ideas, um, and, and they're all coming together, which is very, very encouraging. So I'm very glad that Paradigm and um, the Brazilian organizations, the organizations from India are getting together, and I think this is the sort of regional solidarities and conversations that need to be built on. What we need to focus on now is how um, we can use this research for advocacy and how can the advocacy be most effective uh, knowing what we have and using what we know um, how do we push this forward um, and I think just coming up with like a joint advocacy strategy would be really really amazing where um, where we we have the research uh, you know that you spoke about where the global south activists are talking about okay these are the issues so now what next um, and I think that also sort of excites me uh, because because it shows that we have some backing of you know knowledge and now we're moving forward as to um, how to communicate with states and I think that is really what the focus needs to be on. Absolutely. Thank you so much. For, uh, you know, there are so many different points of convergence and also now clear strategies to move from research. Well, first from making knowledge accessible, creating new knowledge and then figuring out how to expand and disseminate that knowledge through a joint advocacy agenda, and I really like that, and I agree. I think that sometimes uh, the idea of technology is so interesting that you make strange bedfellows. Sometimes you're, <laughs> you know, aligning with the, the private sector, and sometimes you're, you know, aligning with the state, and I think that flexibility, nimbleness, and the commitment to you know, civil society is really, really critical. I wanted to move uh, to the online attendees. I know it's been a little bit of a long runway to get there, but uh, I wanted to go to the online moderator, Jacqueline, and to see if she might be able to take a few questions and comments. 
Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hello, Asta. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry. I'm not able to turn on my camera today, uh, but we have no questions or uh, comments yet. Uh, I would just like to thank everyone who's in the room. This has been a very interesting session. And also, I like to comment on behalf of Data Privacy Brazil uh, about this uh, joint contribution that we made at the beginning of this year to the Global Digital Compact of the UN. We made this joint contribution with uh, civil society entities from, uh, from India, with the APT Institute, with the Paradigm Initiative, and also with partners from Internet Bolivia in Latin America. So I think this was a huge uh, step for us in this uh, Global South solidarities that we are discussing. And I totally agree with the last uh, speaker regarding the participation that we must have uh, on advocacy, especially in relation with uh, government representatives, because we are seeing that a lot of these processes and issues that you guys brought today, like surveillance, internet shutdowns, censorship, these are being mostly discussed in multilateral spaces. Like we have this committee on cybercrime happening at the UN, and we have so uh, a little few spaces for civil society to participate. So I think that's very important for us to contribute together like we did and still trying to engage, but looking at the representatives from our governments to try to engage uh, more effective in this process. So. That's my comment for now. Great, thanks so much, Jacqueline, and uh, everybody else who's online. Um, you know, we can continue this conversation. We have a little Slack channel, we have a mailing list, so you know, write to one of us and we'll add you on to that. Um, just in terms of, uh, I know we have a few more minutes left, but I wanted to just call out some of the next steps. So as I mentioned earlier, the call for applications for the digital librarian for this Global South Solidarities is already out. Uh, and uh, we're in the process of reviewing those resumes and making sure that we have one person who we can all go to to ask all our deep questions around where is this in the digital universe. Um, and somebody who's gonna curate all our work, somebody who's gonna make sure that things are organized and do the hard work that librarians do. The second part of this is uh, the idea of the fund, which I think uh, you know many interesting opportunities in that have come up. What we're also gonna do is try to map uh, where similar initiatives are. Um, because, you know, basis this conversation, we've learned that there are indeed some uh, solidarities and efforts that are being done across the world to bring different types of organizations in the Global South and on around different issues uh, together. So, you know, we, we're going to do a little bit of that landscape and then come back to this group um, with a clear agenda. I know that the fund will be uh, launched and announced in November in Brazil, which has been lovely. Um, but, um, but yeah, and thank you so much for being here um, and for engaging in this very early morning conversation on day one. Um, you know, we'll see you guys over the course of the next few days and hopefully to keep continue chatting about this. Thank you.
Ah, is it working now? Yeah, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> yeah, um, hello everyone. Uh, thanks everyone for joining for this uh, yeah quite uh, early early session. Uh, my name is Niels Brinker, and uh, today I wanted to talk a brief uh, lightning talk about um, cybersecurity regulation and the way um, uh, yeah we do it uh, in the European Union and what are um, give an overview about the current uh, regulatory uh, efforts of the European Union as well as um, yeah dive a bit deeper into like the the methods that are that are used within those regulations as well as um, yeah what uh, what issues are come coming up with that so yeah um, I work for the Digital Society Institute of the SMT Berlin and um, as well uh, I'm a fellow of the European Cyber Conflict Research Initiative. And um, yeah currently mainly working um, yeah used to um, work um, on project on the systemization of IT security law, and um, right now working in a um, yeah accompanying research project um, about uh, digital identities. Yeah, so let's um, yeah start and um, dive right into it. So, like to give you a briefly overview: what are the current regulatory uh, regulatory efforts of the EU? Um, there are like two main former um, former um, regulations um, or directives, and uh, two that um, are right now more or less uh, work in progress. Um, yeah, the first um, uh, is the was the Cybersecurity Act of uh, two thousand nineteen. Um, yeah, I think all those regulations kind of have like an. Uh, headline issue in the, the short description. It's called Cybersecurity Act, but um, uh, in a way, what it's all that it does is, in a way, um, it in, uh, formalizes the mandate of ENISA, which is like the major um, European cybersecurity authority. It was uh, established, I think, in 2011. Um, yeah, don't pin me down on the date, but it uh, were, uh, were around like for quite some years. Um, and uh, therefore, like the Cybersecurity Act um, formalized the mandate. Um, and it also introduced um, um, yeah, uh, a formal process to articulate um, European cybersecurity uh, certification schemes. So uh, you can. Um, um, with those certification schemes, you can, as an ITC um, operator or um, manufacturer, um, you can aim to um, yeah, formulate um, um, dedicated certifications for specific use cases um, and therefore choose a certification based uh, approach to cyber security. Um, to be honest, I think there are right now, like the Cyber Security Act was. Um, was agreed upon in 2019, but so far um, they are, I think, the only major certification scheme that is work in progress is a um, European Cyber Certification Scheme on uh, cloud computing, but otherwise there's, um, yeah, not much going on more. Um, then, um, yeah, some of you may heard about uh, the NIST 2 directive, uh, which uh, was agreed upon in um, December 2022. Um, this directive um, generally um, addresses uh, operators of um, critical infrastructure to implement certain um, yeah, security measures uh, to uh, secure their services. So um, the aim of uh, that directive was mainly yeah, critical infrastructure and critical services. Mm, there's one major regulation um, 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 work in progress is the um, proposal for a Cyber Resilience Act. And there you can see like the headline prog um, problem again, like basically, so like the long title about this from the Cyber Security Act is a regulation on um, horizontal um um, horizontal requirements for projects with um, products with uh, digital elements, um, and yeah, short title is Cyber Resilience Act. I don't know why it's called Cyber Resilience Act. In in the end, it has nothing to do with cyber resilience. In the end, it's like cyber security and product safety um, 
uh, to go all, all the way. Um, but I just guess like the name Cybersecurity Act was already taken. So and uh, yeah, cyber resilience uh, was kind of the, the newer buzzword uh, to use in that sphere. And therefore, yeah, why not take it as a short title? Um, yeah, as I said, it's still a work in progress. I think it's uh, in the trilog discussion right now. Um, yeah, as I uh, as I said, it regulates the safety and security of uh, digital products or products with um, digital elements, um, and therefore um, the main approach of the Cyber Resilience Act is uh, product safety regulation. So, therefore, when you enter a market and um, yeah want to market your product. Um, within the European Union, um, then you have to comply to certain um, product safety and security standards, which in this case also includes um, means of uh, cyber security. Um, yeah, just like to put it in is like not mainly a cyber security regulation, but um, just uh, um, yeah, to mention it, it's, uh, there's also the proposal for an AI Act, which um, takes a rich-based approach uh, at regulating certain high-risk AI use cases. So um, it doesn't regulate AI as a, um, as a technique or um, the technical implementation itself, but um, certain use cases which are seen as uh, high-risk uh, have to comply to certain, uh, certain security um, uh, um, um, n not only cyber security, but like um, um, basically, yeah, security and uh, risk management um, uh, requirements um, all in all. And this is all, um, as I said, it's like um, the, the contact point for the regulation, there's the, the use case, and therefore it's uh, also a product security, um, yeah, product uh, safety regulation, um, product security regulation um, in, its, in its heart, in its core. Um, yeah, so you saw like the, um, just to give you an um, idea like what it's actually, why it's actually so complicated um, to approaching cybersecurity uh, from a regulatory perspective. Mm, it's, um, yeah, the latest, uh, um, the latest uh, European efforts I talked about um, were, um, yeah, quite recent, but it's like not that in the European Union and especially in the member states, um, the, um, there was like no um, cybersecurity regulation um, before. Um, you can like in example overview about like uh, how it's managed in um, in Germany. There were like cross uh, sectorial IT security law, like uh, as I said, the um, NIST directive. Um, the um, yeah, NIST two directive had a predecessor, um, NIST one directive, um, and therefore a critical infrastructure was uh, mainly um, regulated before. Like the main um, new thing about the NIST two directive is that the scope of the regular um, re regulated entities has broadened uh, significantly. There was like the GDPR. Um, uh, the BSE uh, law is uh, actually like the um, German implementation of the NIST two directive, and um, but they they existed also like uh, a lot of um, sector specific IT security law, which is was like kind of hist uh, historically grown. Like there was like telecommunication law, uh, law for medical products, energy law. Um, those sector specific laws. Um, existed long time before uh, anybody thought about cybersecurity but like um, it depended uh, uh, it depended like some sometime in the early 2000s when there was like a, a regulatory update of those regulations uh, somebody thought oh yeah this uh, cybersecurity stuff is uh, now uh, coming uh, is now getting more important like people use uh, start to use like computers to actually uh, uh, operate uh, a power plant and therefore um, they crammed in something like uh, um, just like one paragraph like appropriate technical and organizational measures for the security of the um, of the services has uh, have to be implemented something like that um, uh, and therefore was like it is still like a big historically grown uh, eclectic eclectic body and um, even though there were like recent uh, recent efforts, for example, uh, within this two directive, uh, to um, yeah um, 
mm, make this uh, make this jungle of laws a bit more approachable. But of course, like regulation uh, changes uh, changes um, uh, changes slowly, and uh, therefore, um, yeah, it might take some time. And I think you can like a good. Uh, you can compare it like to a um, to a legacy system. Like it's not no different like to an IT system in a way. Like you have like a lot of legacy systems that are historically grown, uh, and um, uh, in the end of the day, nobody wants to touch them uh, and want to start on a on a blank blank uh, paper um, once over. And therefore, um, yeah, it might take some time uh, till it's um, to get a bit more overview in it. Yeah. Um, what were like the basic uh, basic methods used in those regulations? Like to give you like a very a very brief uh, and high level overview. Of course, there were like public law measures that uh, require member states to, at first, um, yeah, implement institutions and authorities to enforce obligations because like when you uh, when you make obligations for the private sector, you need an authority to. Um, uh, to uh, to check if all uh, of all those obligations are met by the private sector. Um, also, like in the NIST two directive, there was uh, um, an effort to uh, create something like a cybersecurity incident response team, um, in order that um, yeah, uh, member states have like a public authority that uh, uh, if there's like a, a large scale cyber incident uh, to be uh, to be seen, uh, that they can. Uh, help direct, organize, and um, uh, yeah, mitigate uh, the the fallout of those uh, large scale incidents. Um, but I think like the core and um, major point of uh, um, major point of the um, uh, of cybersecurity generation um, regulation in Europe in general is like the obligations for the private sector. Like as I said, uh, it grew from the. Um, if you are like in a regulated sector, then you have to basically, um, yeah, um, implement uh, um, appropriate technical and organizational measures to ensure the security of your uh, of your service or your product. And um, the way this is usually conducted is by by risk management. So there's like no one size fits all. Um, and here's your checklist, compliant checklist of measures that you have to implement. But like in general, it's um, uh, the private institution have to conduct like a risk management by themselves, and therefore the result of this risk management is the actual measures that have to be implemented um, for the most part. And I think this is um, uh, this risk based across is, is generally um, a new approach um, historically. It was like more common to um, to actually state explicit uh, explicit technical requirements either way explicitly in the law, which is still the case in the NIS2 um, directive. For example, there's like a catalog of uh, actual uh, measures um, you have to implement. Um, some are very abstract, um, like the risk management themselves, or some are like actually more a bit uh, explicit, like. Um, uh, yeah, backup management, or that you have to uh, think about encryption and all the stuff. Mm. But like very historically speaking, for example, in the field of um, medical products, um, it was uh, there existed like a certification-based approach that uh, yeah, there's like no not really a risk management involved, but like um, in order to for your medical product to get certified, there were like certain standards uh, which uh, contained like actual um, explicit method measures that you had to implement, and therefore um, yeah, those uh, um, this was like an uh, a way it was done back in the days. Um, I think this approach, like this certification-based approach, is still valid, like for very explicit use cases, like medical products, like a very explicit use case. But it's like uh, not a good measure to um, to do it, like in uh, uh, yeah cross uh, cross sectoral law. Um, yeah, when you want to uh, address like. Uh, um, because like the uh, situation in each sector is still like too different to um, yeah require explicit technical measures here uh, those uh, uh, manufacturers or providers have to implement. Um, 
yeah, um, this was like the uh, yeah very high level overview about like the actual uh, actual tools and uh, measures uh, those regulation contained. Um, selected issues. Um, one selected issue uh, I should say example of. Uh, digital identities, like uh, why, for one reason, it's like my current project I'm, I'm working on. Um, but for the uh, on the other side, I think it's a good, um, this is a very raw sketch, but I think it uh, illustrates very good um, like what is actually, why it's actually so hard to come up with a working cybersecurity regulation, because um, yeah, like digital identities are still, at least in Germany, we are not Estonia, um, it's a very um, new field in a way. There's like not really like an, uh, like an infrastructure set up and there are like a lot of different stakeholders that um, um, yeah, have like interest and like also are interested in proper cyber security measures. Um, like for digital identities, for example, you have like two different regulations. You have like the NIST 2 directive because trust providers are uh, regulated as a critical infrastructure. But then, of course, you have like the um, IDAS directive, which is um, yeah, um, a directive on uh, um, digital si identities and which is like more sector specific and like in practical, you can always have to like. Um, see if those two pieces of regulations really work together, if they are like, um, if they contradict each other, like if there are like two separate paragraphs that um, regulate the same thing actually and then you have to uh, come up with a solution which one is actually implies, uh, which is uh, uh, applies, um, which is like the Lex Specialis or um, um, yes and this is like then a uh, then ongoing legal discussion. There are actually like established standards and norms for digital si identities and especially like um, with N uh, the NIST 2 directive, like the most established standards were like um, considering the regular, um, the IDAS regulation and um, uh, yeah, and with the NIST 2 it's again like the, the question, okay, when I uh, am certified for and I implemented standards for cybersecurity or digital identities concerning the IDAS regulation, um, but is it still, can I just like copy paste everything in order to um, uh, prove my compliance with N uh, NIST 2? Then of course there are like the technical requirements, which is like, of course, like a first, like the technical re reality, I would call it. It's, um, yeah, uh, what can you actually technically do? But also like the, yeah, I think the, the market implications like the, um, for example, for digital identities, um, there's the, uh, one part of it is like a secure element, which uh, when you have like your wallet on your phone, like the phone needs to actually have like a secure element in it and, uh, Therefore, in a way, like the phone manufacturer dictate how the secure element actually uh, actually looks like. And therefore, um, also like market interest come into uh, market interests come into play, and um, yeah, then it's like the use cases uh, as I would uh, call it, like the actual thing where you need digital cell identities, for example, like for not only um, in the cases where you actually show your passport, but like for example. Um, um, mm, uh, yeah, for hotel res reservations uh, or um, going to the library and uh, stuff like this, um, which is also affected by other regulations. And of course, there's like always like uh, the users, not only the people that uh, implement the um, uh, implement the actual infrastructure and uh, use cases, uh, which have like an interest, like how those use cases are designed, but also like how like the uh, general uh, infrastructure of digital identities is designed, and all this is like like at least in Germany, it's like new. It's an evolving uh, it's an evolving ecosystem, um, and therefore um, it's very very complex to. Um, yeah, to um, recognize every uh, uh, every requirement and every uh, in interest of uh, every stakeholder. Um, yeah, like another uh, very briefly, like another um, uh, selected issue 
um, it's with the risk management itself, it's like a risk management is now like the, uh, the fancy method to come up with actual te technical measures. There are like established standards and uh, like how to actually conduct them a risk management. It usually like contains stuff, stuff like first of like context establishment, like get to know uh, like your system, um, risk identification, like what could actually go wrong and uh, risk estimation, like how possible is it that uh, um, uh, stuff goes wrong, risk evalu um, evaluation, um, yeah, just like risk as it's defined, it's like uh, um, probability and uh, possible uh, to be uh, damage to be expected. And then the, the risk treatment, so that's where you come up with like the actual technical and representational measures to, um, uh, to be implemented. Um, yeah, it's so risk management is nothing new, but like in the end of the day, like in the existing regulation, who has to conduct like the risk management? Um, for the most of the time, there's like no conflict of interest. For uh, interest, for example, when you're a provider of uh, critical infrastructure, um, you are also interested that like a power plant of, um, provider is uh, interested that his power plant uh, doesn't get hacked because he has like an uh, economic interest in in it, but like. This is like the pro of cybersecurity regulation. I would say that like the interests generally align, but like at the end of the day, it's also, um, for example, in the cybersecurity um, um, uh, cyber uh, cyber resilience act, um, as a product manufacturer that has to conduct this risk assessment, it's I have like I have the interested uh, interest to market my product on the European market and therefore um, uh, it's it's a sub there are standards to um, take the make the risk um, management like as objective as possible but like in the end of the day you cannot never take the perspective of the uh, of the entity that actually has to uh, conduct the risk assessment um, out of the equation it's always uh, a slight slight subjectivity to it and um, this is actually uh, this is um, actually um, uh, hard when it comes like to third party risk when it's like uh, and in practice it's very it's not easy to um, uh, yeah always yeah change the perspective and uh, also um, consider risks that are not uh, for yourself but like uh, for other other persons um, yeah, this was like the this was it with the substance, and um, I would like um, uh, uh, yeah ask you if you have like any points or any uh, any questions uh, to yeah hopefully have a short but a fruitful discussion. Hey, so I have a question around, so you mentioned reg like you use medical product regulation as an example, and then you also mentioned like critical infrastructure. And I'm just curious about whether you, like how you think about the secured, like in, instead of thinking maybe so much around the downstream regulation of the products, like you mentioned product security a few times, how do you think about like how European, how the European Union currently secures, like critical hardware components like chips, and how whether you see any sort of regulation or export controls around those critical security, critical hardware components of, you know, our inf that run our infrastructure, especially as they host more, you know, advanced IP and stuff like that. Um. Yeah, I, th I think in the NISTRU direct um, directive there is uh, a part uh, to consider um, supply chain risk. Um, so in order, um, yeah, in, in that way, like the um, the private entity has to consider um, the manufacturers. They get their um, chips and their um, uh, technical components from. 
um, in order to, uh, yeah, not only from a cybersecurity perspective, but also like to don't get reliant to uh, get reliant on one uh, one manufacturer. I think the yeah 5G um, uh, um, 5G issue was like the most prominent one. Um, Export controls, I actually don't know, but like, especially when it comes to the semiconductors, there were like um, uh, strategic regulations, like to uh, and thoughts, like uh, to actually become less um, less reliant on, yeah, let's name it like Chinese uh, manufacturers. Hi. Um. It's been really interesting dis to listen to, to you. Uh, I might maybe start by saying that I work in the European Parliament and work mm -hmm. on these legislations. Um, so to answer also your question, the CRA, the Cyber Resilience Act, actually covers semiconductors, so they should be more uh, secure uh, once it's in force. But one element that I'm, I'm missing also on, on the European level when we talk about these uh, legislations is, is really the how we bring in more the human element, how we bring the kind of the third element that's missing is you can su uh, secure your, your services or your and then the supply chains through uh, um, product regulation, but we still need more awareness and bringing it into to everybody of us understanding what cybersecurity is. So I would be interested in, in hearing how you see kind of how this can fit uh, in this whole uh, package of, uh, of all legislations that we have on the table, the, the more human element of it, because it's, of course, one important one for cybersecurity. Um, I think the, the um, yeah, the humor, human uh, element is uh, is important, but um, the I think is always important to consider who to address, like do we address like the end user? Um, and my opinion is we should not like to, um, I mean, it's, always good to uh, the end uh, users um, aware, but um, we have like limited resor uh, resources and um, like typical example, like you roll out like a um, fake phishing email campaign and like in order to make like a awareness trainer for your employers and, um, but then at the end of the day, this is like the end users not where it goes wrong to begin with, like to be frank, like if you rely that um, yeah, uh, Thomas from accounting, 60 years old, doesn't click on a cat picture in order for your uh, in order for for your um, organization to don't get hacked. It's like not Thomas' fault. It's like your system security was shitty to begin with, um, and therefore I think the um, the accuracy of those human elements and awareness and education is like more like the. Um, um, yeah, like the manufacturers, like the uh, programmers, like, um, yeah, consider cybersecurity when setting up the architecture for your for your product and um, uh, for the coders, yeah, what are like the common uh, common uh, mistakes um, and that cause cybersecurity issues. And therefore, um, yeah, um, and this is, yeah, the main point is like, don't focus too much on the end user, but uh, on the on the technical uh, administrators and team that actually uh, um, implement and um, make those products. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, I have one question. Uh, any policy must have some tools to investigate the operation of that policy, I think. According to that purpose, uh, European Union provide the MEXA, M-E-C-S-A, which is a tool to check the uh, mail security of mail server. So I think it's a very good you know, uh, tool to investigate the operation of each server. My question is, after that op uh, tools introduced to European Union, uh, what is the effect of that tool? It reduced the, you know, uh, security level, or uh, or uh, increase the level of the security of each server in the uh, European Union. For instance, uh, I found you know almost none of the uh, companies use 
DNS security. Why? Because it protects your server for, uh, for uh, spoof spoofing, I think. But almost none of that. So most important, what is the tendency not to use such kind of important tool? It is very cheap to introduce and very you know, effective. But almost none of the, our companies use such an important tools right now. Yes, that's a great question, and I have to actually have to admit I have no clue why they <laughs> don't uh, implement it. I think uh, the general problem of cybersecurity in organizations is uh, like in internet companies it shouldn't be, but like especially like in non-tech industries, like cybersecurity was always like this abstract thing. It just cost money, and uh, um, therefore um, it was like not um yeah people just like didn't want to it doesn't didn't uh, generate money it didn't generate profit and therefore people were not eager to like invest in it um i think maybe like to be a bit cynical ransomware did a good job in like bringing the abstract danger into like the minds of uh, executive because there you have like a very very um yeah vivid picture what uh, of the actual damage that uh, that can be caused through um uh, through cyber security incidents yeah thank you may i yeah thank you um so i think that it, there's a very important question a very interesting question that connects slightly with a with a cra even though the dnssec part isn't really in scope However, what both questions have in common, or both the, the regulation uh, addresses outside your, your particular example, is that there are economic counter incentives to deploying security systems um, in the mass market. You mentioned it's a product, first and foremost, the CRA is a product safety regulation, right? Which is why it goes, with, it makes use of uh, a whole set of prearranged uh, tools that are available on the regulatory side. Um, the radio equipment directive is the predecessor kind of on the regulatory, uh, in the regulatory toolbox. Um, and uh, the threat model is the cheap cameras coming from somewhere um, that are thrown on the market without any support uh, for software updates, security updates, and so on and so forth. Um, and why is that? Because people don't want to pay extra for the secu security, and that is, kind of comparable to your example, right? So DNSSEC is something, first of all, is not something you add to a product. It's a system that needs to be deployed in various places, needs cooperation and so on and so forth. But economic counter incentives in the mass market, I guess, is what, what both have in common and that might be something to in, inform the discussion. And of course, the CRA is also a response to very prominent threats. Some of you might remember the Log4j incident, which was a, uh, and then open source comes into play, but that does, it's not the main point, but Log4j is the one that, that maybe not triggered this, but would be a, a, a prime example for some things that, that trigger this kind of regulation. Everybody was crying around that this is a very important piece of software that is deployed all over the place, and it was maybe unmaintained or working on a shoestring budget because a single individual was quote, quote, responsible for this, and it is deployed everywhere in products and in critical infrastructure, and I think that's what the CRA in part tries to address. So the, the but the economics are very important in, in this part and should be looked onto. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, and I agree, and I think we uh, came uh, to the end of this uh, session. So, uh, I have a quick question. Ah, okay. sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah, basically, it was a good presentation. I am Narayan Timilsina from Nepal. So when we talk about uh, regulation uh, on cyber security, uh, particularly what I understood is we have to go through from some dimensions such as governments, governance, uh, partnership, workforce development, and public awareness, as she said about human capital. So uh, in EU, uh, is what quick, so uh, does it cover all these aspects uh, in, in a single uh, uh, act, or, or it's, it's very separate? Um, very separate, like um, 
and um, NIST 2 is um, uh, is on critical infrastructure, as I said, CIA is on, uh, uh, on products. Um, like when uh, the, those categories you mentioned, like uh, it was gov government, uh, governance, y human um, aspect, it's, um, it, I think it's like not, especially like, for example, like the human aspect, it's, um, uh, it's kind of thought of a bit like in, uh, in, um, NIST too, but uh, like in general, you, you could say like there's like no overarching uh, IT security uh, law in uh, uh, in the European Union. Like, and why is that? Like, uh, as I said in the beginning, it's like everything is a bit um, historically grown, and um, some sectors are like m very uh, yeah um, uh, further on their way. For example, like financial sectors, like a uh, historically very uh, very tightly regulated sector. Um, and there therefore there there were efforts like to consolidate it a bit, but um, in general it's still a bit like uh, um, yeah, it's scattered around. Okay, uh, yeah, then I think we came um, to the end of this uh, session. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your for your questions, and uh, yeah, then see you see you soon on on the venue.